Welcome to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Our program is sponsored by Awake Us Now. We have a heart to see awakening in America. Revelation is a study many of you have been asking for. So here's Pastor with today's teaching on Revelation. Open your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 10. We're going to pick up where we had left off last time. We're moving into another section now of this book. Here in chapter 10, there's suddenly a pause. We've been looking at the vision John saw of the seven angels with the seven trumpets. And last week we had concluded with trumpet number six. But now there is a pause, just as we saw with the vision of the seven seals. Remember there was a pause between seal six and seal seven? So also now with the trumpets. And we're introduced to a section that is frequently referred to as the section of the angel and the little scroll. And so we begin here in Revelation 10 with these words. John writes, he says, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun and his legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hand. And then John goes on to describe that scroll. Listen to these words, middle of verse two. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And by the way, in the scriptures, when there is discussion of the land and the sea. It's usually referring to the land of Israel, the promised land, and the violent sea, the Gentile non-believing world. This angel has a message to share with Jew and Gentile alike, with the believing world and the unbelieving world. And he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. I read those words, I can't help but think about Jesus as the lion of Judah. He gave a roar, a loud shout like the roar of a lion. When he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven say, Seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. Well, <laughs> right there all sorts of questions arise. You know, what are we dealing with here? The seven thunders, as, as we've seen throughout the book of Revelation, the number seven has very, very prophetic significance. It, it symbolized completion, the fullness, an absolute declaration that can be trusted and is confidently true. The seven thunders speak, and yet John is told, don't write it down. These things are held for a later day. How do we interpret that? Once again, what we have seen over the centuries is that devout believers who honor God, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, trust the scriptures as God's infallible word. They have come to a wide variety of conclusions on what this is all about with this little scroll and the seven thunders and sealing up what has been announced. The preterists, those who believe that everything in the book of Revelation was fulfilled in the first century and specifically with destruction of Jerusalem, the preterist looks at these seven thunders and the message that John is told to seal up, and they say this refers to things that will happen after the first century, things that have not yet been revealed. The historicist looks at this, and specifically at the little scroll, and says while the seven thunders are yet to be revealed, the little scroll speaks about something very obvious and very historical. And for the historicist, it usually is interpreted to mean the papacy and the Reformation. Keep in mind, during the Middle Ages, the papacy had become an institution unto itself. It exercised both political and religious power. There were many benefits of that at a time when the world was collapsing, but there were also horrific spiritual results. The papacy became a truly immoral institution. What is described now about the little scroll and the materials that follow, the historicists have seen as describing the papacy and the coming of the Reformation. The futurist looks at this and says, this is a parenthetical section. 
it's a momentary pause before we get into the good stuff that describes the very last years of the world's history. And then finally, the idealist looks at the little scroll and says that what's on that little scroll is a message for the entire world in every day and in every age. What all of them are more or less agreed on, however, is this. The seven thunders, the things that John is told, keep quiet about, seal them up. Those are things that belong to the Lord. There's a great passage in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, as God speaks through Moses and says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. There is incredible wisdom in the knowledge of this verse, because what it's saying is, there are things that God has kept totally to himself. They will only be revealed at the proper time. You and I are not going to be able to figure them out, and we shouldn't waste our time trying to. Instead, what we ought to concentrate on are the things that are clear and obvious as God's word speaks into each one of our hearts and into each one of our lives. That principle first set forth in the Torah, in the book of Deuteronomy, is a principle that ought to be received by every believer. It is so easy to run after all sorts of silly rabbit trails and come up with all sorts of possible explanations and then miss what matters most. Please keep in mind, the fear of the Lord, the awe of God, is the beginning of knowledge. It is the beginning of wisdom. We need to have the wisdom to recognize the secret things belong to the Lord our God. So on that note, let's continue on as we take a look at what John saw, moving all the way down then to verse 5. Then the angel I had seen, standing on the sea and on the land, raised his right hand to heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it, and said, there will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Whoa, this angel speaks the very words of God. He raises his right hand as an oath, and he speaks by him who is forever and ever, who created all things. And what does he say? He says, in the days of the seventh angel, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. You know, in the Old Testament book of Amos, chapter 3, verse 7, we're told that the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing it to his servants, the prophets. And we have that same phrase here now in Revelation 10. And what it's stressing is God is going to do what he has always said he will accomplish. In times of perplexity, we need to rest assured in confidence that God will accomplish what he has declared he will do. And so we read these words, verse 8, Then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me once more, Go, Take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. And then verse 9. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. And once again, we have here another instance in the book of Revelation. This book is filled with such instances. Another instance of things that John saw that sound exactly like things we read in the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament. What immediately comes to mind when you read about eating the scroll is the prophet Ezekiel. Keep in mind, Ezekiel was living in Babylon. The children of Judah had been exiled 
Many of them had gone off to Babylon. Ezekiel was one who was taken away, but he was given a ministry by God to prophesy about what would happen, to prophesy of the coming destruction of the temple that would happen during his lifetime in Babylon. And he was told to eat a scroll. It was the message that God was giving him, a message that was powerful, but a message that would not be received by the people of Judah for the most part. It would be a painful message. It's God's word. It's good. But so many would not receive it. It leaves you, if I may, with spiritual indigestion. And that's what John is describing here. He's given this little scroll that contains the declaration of what God is going to be doing. It tastes sweet in his mouth because the word of God is true and pure and holy and good and gracious. But when people will not receive that word, the result is a deep sense of sorrow, a deep sense of mourning. And what John is being told here, in effect, is here's the message I've given you to declare to the world. But many will not take it to their own destruction. These are sobering words. And they're words that remind us of the importance of not only hearing God's word, but acting on it. Of not only knowing what it says, but following what it says. In the last days, the scripture makes it clear, there will be terrible times. That's what Paul tells Timothy. And as we saw last week, as we got to the very end of chapter 9, even though there were great wonders being done, people still did not repent. God's desire is to bring all people to repentance. And even in the midst of difficulty, trial, and judgment, his ultimate concern is that people turn back to him. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. That's what God declared. And here now, John takes this message from God, this little scroll, eats it. It tastes so good, but it leaves him with heartburn because so many do not receive it. In our day, you and I need not only to heed that word, we need to be praying for those who haven't yet heeded or received it. Praying that God will move in mighty ways because God listens to the prayers of his people. And that too, let's be honest, that's something we have seen all through this book so far, isn't it? He hears the prayers of his children. He responds to them. He answers them. And he's calling us to pray. Pray for our loved ones. Pray for our friends, our neighbors. Pray for our enemies. Pray for our nation. Pray for the nations of the world that hearts may be turned back to God. We pray for awakening. That's at the heart of our name. Awake us now. Awakening, that is what God has always desired. He desires to call his people back to himself. And that is what John is given here. The call to share the message of law and gospel, of God's mercy, but also of the judgment against rebellion and unrepentance. To speak words that are gracious, tasty words, but words which, when they are not received, bring heartburn. Well, let's continue on then with Revelation chapter 11. Here now we come to a, a section that revolves around a period of time. In fact, there will be multiple ways that will be expressed in Revelation chapters 11 and 12, and then moving on into chapter 13. It's described as 1260 days, and, and I think it worthwhile for us just to take a look at what that's all about. 1260 days. Now keep in mind, the Jewish people, historically, culturally, traditionally, throughout the centuries, have used what is, is called a lunar calendar, a calendar that is based on a lunar cycle from full moon to full moon. And 1260 days in a lunar calendar is the equivalent of three and a half years because a lunar year is 360 days. 
So 1260 days is three and a half years. But as we move forward in this book into Revelation 11 and 12, we're also going to hear about 42 months. It's the same thing. It too is three and a half years. And then as we get into chapter 12, we're also going to hear the phrase time, times, and half a time that comes out of the book of Daniel. And that too is three and a half years. Time, one year, times, two years, half a time, half a year. So when we see those phrases, it's important for us to keep that in mind as we take a look at these words here in uh, Revelation chapter 11. And once again, I'd just like to note how various individuals, groups, scholars, Bible students have interpreted these words over the years. Going back to the Preterist view, which maintains everything revolves around the first century and the destruction of Jerusalem. The Preterist says those 1260 days, that refers to the period of the Jewish war and or the time of Nero's persecution of the early believers in Jesus. And interestingly enough, the Jewish war did last for three and a half years. And interestingly enough, as best we can tell from Roman records, Nero's persecution of the Christians lasted for three and a half years. Coincidence? Or is this another example of God enabling what he has given to his prophet John to apply in every day, in every age, and every time? As a result, the historicist, those who are in that camp and have been over the centuries, they say that the 1260 days, usually they say, I should say, uh, they have traditionally said that the 1260 days are days of years, that this represents a period of 1260 years. And they maintain that that pretty well encompasses the time of papal supremacy where the church had wandered so far away from biblical truth and where, quite honestly, the hierarchy was more concerned about feathering their own nests and maintaining uh, temporal, worldly power than worried about things spiritual. The historicist has traditionally said that refers to about a 1260-year period, of the supremacy of the papacy that finally changed. Usually the date that is used is in the late 1700s, early 1800s, with the time of Napoleon and the humbling of the Pope with Napoleon's crowning. The futurist looks at this and says the 1260 days represent the final three and a half years of the great tribulation period at the very end of time. And the idealist, on the other hand, looks at this and says the 1260 days represents an extended period of time, which is frequently referred to as the age of the church, the period until the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the way these words have been interpreted over the centuries. Again, do we look at this and say, well, this one is right and those are wrong? I believe, quite honestly, these are things that have spoken to the hearts of devout believers, students of the scripture, people who believe the truthfulness of God's word. And I believe it may not be a case of one's wrong and the other is right, but rather a case that each of them speaks at a given time in a given way to God's people. God is brilliant. We need to come back to that. The fear of the Lord, the awe of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. We talked about the fact that the preterist believes that everything was fulfilled in the first century. The historicist believes this talks about the rise of the papacy and its ultimate decline. St. Peter's Basilica was built in an attempt to unify the church so that everyone could contribute to the building of this massive, massive structure. In reality, the building of St. Peter's brought on the Protestant Reformation because the way they built this was to sell indulgences. You could buy your way in and buy your loved ones out of purgatory, and that triggered the Protestant Reformation. The Pope at that time was Pope Leo X. In the case of Leo X, he was a brilliant individual, incredibly cultured, 
a man who was a patron of the arts, but he couldn't see the truth. By grace, through faith in Christ Jesus. And it's a warning to each and every one of us. The fear of the Lord, the awe of God, is the beginning of knowledge and of wisdom. And it is the awe of God that we ought to seek above everything else. So, on that note, we go back. The futurist says this refers to the final years of the tribulation. The idealist says it refers to the entire church age. But here is what John said. (laughs) John said this. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshipers. I was given a reed like a measuring rod. And again, this is an ongoing instance of things being revealed to John that were first revealed to the great Hebrew prophets. You cannot read these words of Revelation 11.1 if you have also read the Old Testament and not be struck by the fact that they sound really familiar because God spoke through his prophet Ezekiel. And he told him in the last chapters of the book of Ezekiel, from Ezekiel 40 through 47, God talked to Ezekiel and told him to measure the temple of God. And now John is told the same thing. Following in the footsteps of the prophets, he's told to measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshipers. But then he is also told this, verse 2, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. There are two words used in the New Testament to describe the temple at Jerusalem. The one is the Greek word naos, which means the sanctuary, the holy of holies, the place where only the high priest could go and then the holy place where only the priests could go and that only once in a lifetime. The word that is used here for the temple of God is naos. So John is told to measure the sanctuary. He is told to exclude the outer court. The other word that is used in the scriptures to describe the temple is the Greek word hieron. And that is the word that refers to the entire complex, specifically the court of the Gentiles that surrounded the central sanctuary. John is told that that outer court area has been given to the Gentiles and they will trample on the holy city for 42 months. Now, those who interpret these words have come up with all sorts of different interpretations. The preterist says this is referring to Jerusalem. It's referring to the temple that was still standing Some have suggested at the time John wrote this because there are many who believe that he actually wrote it before the year 70 AD. And they say what he is being told to do here is to measure the sanctuary and the true believers, not all of the others who are just along for the ride. And he mentions then that it will be given to the Gentiles and they will trample on the holy city for 42 months. The preterist looks at that and says, remember what Jesus said in Luke 21, verse 24. He said, Jerusalem will be trampled down by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. And so the preterist looks at this and says, this is describing the destruction of the Jerusalem temple and the Gentiles taking over the city. The historicist looks at this and says, well, the temple here is not the temple of Jerusalem. It's the the true believers in the living God, because what do we know now that Christ has died and risen? We now have direct access to the Father, and we can go to the Holy of Holies in a sense. Individuals who are futurists look at this and say, this refers to an event yet to occur. It refers to the very last days when the temple at Jerusalem will be rebuilt. And after having been trampled down by the Gentiles, it will now be given back to the Jewish people. Those are the widely held views that have been espoused. Time will tell us how many of them nail it right on. 
You've been listening to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Our program is sponsored by Awake Us Now. Have questions about today's message? Text or call us at 612-545-5654 or email us at mail at awakeusnow.com. And join us again next time for Pastor's continued study of the book of Revelation.